Okay, we've got that Bible passage, uh, Judges chapter 6. And let me just at the very outset say that we all have our fears, don't we? Uh, whether that is starting a song before everybody else is ready, or, uh, <laughs> or whether it's, it's something a, a, a little bit more significant. And here's one for Annette. Yep. Arachnophobia. Yep, you're, you're there as well. Uh, and other ones, glossophobia. I mean, I was reading about, about that one, it's the fear of public speaking. And actually, I was understanding that the fear of public speaking rates higher than actually the fear of death. Now, if you work out the logic of that, what that means is that when it comes to someone's funeral, or your funeral, you would rather be the person in the coffin than the one up, up at the front who's actually having to, to, to give the little talk. And uh, for those of you who are scared about public speaking, I, I've got some advice. I, I read this. It says, before you go on stage, stand still and feel the ground beneath your feet. Close your eyes and imagine yourself suspended from the ceiling by a thin thread. Then imagine you're made of rubber. Then look into a mirror and make a horse's laugh with your lips. And why not lie on the ground and pretend you're floating or just collapse on the ground like a limp doll? And as I said in Ballandary this morning, if you want to know what Edwin and I are doing before a service, <laughs> It's probably something uh, along those lines. But again, thinking about, about fears, I've got a few other ones that you may know. There's uh, fear of belly buttons. Uh, I don't think it makes any difference whether it's in or out, but it's, uh, it's there. Or the fear, there's a word, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that one, uh, of having peanut butter stuck to the roof of your mouth. There's a particular word for that. Uh, or that one for the young people here. Uh, the fear of being without your mobile phone, which apparently in 50% of, of younger people is an extreme anxiety. Uh, fear is a, is a feeling, an experience that pervades the whole of Judges chapter 6, the passage that we've read this morning. Uh, and also it continues into uh, Judges chapter 7. Uh, as we read these couple of chapters, we're meant to see this deep anxiety, deep fear that has come upon the nation of Israel because, again, they are being oppressed by neighboring tribes. And every time they're attacked, they're, the, the Israelites are forced to run up into the hills and carry what little they have. So then as we meet Gideon, he's in a wine press and he's in there and he is threshing his wheat. And of course, if you know anything about that, is that that's the very place where you shouldn't be to do that because to thresh the wheat effectively, you need wind and the wind to pass through it. And you're not going to get that sensation down in that, that vat or that wine press. And you could imagine then Gideon there in, in that situation, having a little conversation with the son and the son asks, why can't we just go outside and do this? And Gideon says, well, it's because of those bad boys down there and they might attack us. And then the son again quizzically asked another thing, but do we not have any brave people who can fight against these ones? Which might just bring an awkward silence. But actually, even before we get to Gideon, this passage begins in a very strange manner. God does the most bizarre of things here. If you look at verse 7, you see this sensation of where the people of Israel are. It says that they are crying out to God because of Midian. They feel oppressed. They want a deliverer. They want someone who is going to mightily come and rescue them. That's, that's what they want. But look at how God answers that cry or that prayer. In verse 8, it says God sent them a prophet. Now, you've got here very clearly, the people of Israel are wanting a deliverer, someone who is mighty and strong as a champion, someone who might lead them, and yet what they get, in effect, is a preacher. 
Uh, people of my age, my generation, because of what our kids were interested in back in the day, will remember a group that were the highest paid entertainers at a time in Australia. You will remember the Wiggles. Some of you can remember the Wiggles. Uh, they had a lot of very famous songs, including Dorothy the, D the Dinosaur, Henry the Octopus, and of course their well-known Toot Toot Chugga Chugga Big Red Car. In one of the episodes that I can remember, the big red car broke down. And lots of people were coming past, offering to help and to bring some sort of assistance. There was a pirate who often appeared, and there was a vet. And it's obvious, even to a two-year-old, that the person who is most uh, adequately uh, experienced and skilled who is able to fix that car is none of these people, but you need a mechanic. You need the proper person to fix whatever is wrong. And so here we come to the nation of Israel, Judges chapter 6, they're crying out to God, we need salvation, we need deliverance. And God sends them a prophet. The people need to understand, I think, what, what God is trying to enlarge in their minds and in their understanding is that actually... What they thought was their biggest problem wasn't their biggest problem. They thought their biggest problem was the Midianites, the people who were oppressing them and endangering their, their lives. And yet, when you go back to verse 1, chapter 6, verse 1, you see that actually the Midianites are there because God sent them, and that God sent them so that they might see that they needed God. So their biggest problem actually was themselves. And skipping down to verse 10, you see another thing that God says about them is that these Midianites are here because you have not listened to me. So they were their biggest problem. They were asking for a deliverer. And God says what you really need is a sermon. And perhaps... Some of you might even be in that situation today. You're here today, and in some sense, you're wanting a sense of deliverance, escape from what is happening in your life, and yet God has something else in store, and that he has brought something to pass, and we've been thinking about this over this past couple of weeks, is that God may bring circumstances to play in your life in, the, in a certain way to make you think doesn't always do that. You can't always say because something bad has happened that therefore you are doing something really wrong. You can't say that, but just sometimes it may be that God is saying that and that you are here this weekend and that you are wanting some sort of escape, some sort of deliverance, and yet what God is saying to you is that I want to speak to your heart. So God causes at times hardship not to pay you back for what you've done wrong, but that he brings these things to bring you back to himself. So let's turn to Gideon. And I think Gideon can resonate with many of us today because we're not strong and we're not mighty people. And when it comes to following God, we can be pretty weak at it at times. And whenever we are thinking about the type of people who might be, as it were, top of the class, when it comes to the type of person that God might choose to be a, a help for him and to do wonderful things in his kingdom, we would think, well, that's not me. We're more aware of what's wrong in our lives and what's right. We're more aware of what might disqualify us from serving and honoring God rather than what might qualify us. So here we've got what Gideon, and he would certainly think it's, it's strange what is happening in his life. And at times we can do exactly the same and we can look around even at one another here in this place and we could say that somebody else is better qualified than me, is that they've got time, they've got the energy, I'm too fearful I could never do that or I could never do the other. I wouldn't have the nerve to do that, but God challenged Gideon. He was the very one. So where did it begin for Gideon? Where does this journey of adventure with God, where does it 
always begin. It always begins, and it will begin for any one of us, with, and I've simply described it as a personal encounter with God. It always begins with you meeting God as a real person. Not just reading about God, not just picking up little bits and, and seeing it as some sort of uh, dry experience out of a book, but it's real, it's, it's vital. It all really begins for Gideon in verse 12. When we read verse 12 together, it says, The angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, and he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And as I've already said, considering the context of where Gideon was in the vat hiding, those words might seem pretty misplaced. Couldn't be me, it must be somebody else, because I'm certainly not mighty, I'm not a warrior, I'm just scared. But as timid as Gideon is, and as timid as we might be, God may just be pressing us at that very point. And it's this idea then of having had a personal encounter with God so that you know that it was God who spoke to you and that God called you to himself, you as an individual, and that it was you that he was concerned about. And it was you he spoke to when you had an understanding of what Jesus had done in your life so that you, you knew what it was to be a Christian. And it is that understanding that it is God who has spoken to you whenever you then start to follow and you start to serve him and doing whatever it is where, whereby you are serving him. But it is that understanding that it is God who has called you to do it is what keeps you going when you will face difficulties because you will face difficulties and you will doubt and you will wonder. But after all, Paul writes, you know, that God chooses the weak things of the world to confound the strong. So we, we can be doing amazing, unusual, unexpected things for God. And it's possible, actually, you're sitting here thinking about this, it may even be the weaknesses in your life. It may even be what has as yet been the failures in your life, the things where you don't see yourself as being qualified, but it may even be those scenarios, those moments, those experiences that God says, right, I'm going to use these things and that experience that you have learned and I'm going to do something because of that and with that. So it may be that's how God has equipped us. But just in passing, and I do want to say something about this angel. Who is this angel that appears to Gideon? You look in verse 12. It says, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said. Now, when it writes that, it's written in the third person. See that? It's from someone who speaks. But when you look down to verse 14, He's no longer described as the angel of the Lord. But verse 14 directly says, the Lord turned to him. That's significant. And I'm going to get a little bit theological here. I'm going to say something and use big words I don't often use. But this is what theologians describe as a Christophany. Okay, Get you to spell that one afterwards. A Christophany. And you ask, well, what is a Christophany? A Christophany is an Old Testament. We're in the Old Testament here. It's an Old Testament appearance of the Son of God. Okay, if you get that, you should be wondering, what is he on about? Because that just, we're almost at Christmas. And in the Gospels, we know what that's about. That's Jesus. That's when Jesus came. But now we're in the Old Testament, and yet as you look between verses 12 and verse 14, what it says about this angel of the Lord is that this is Jesus appearing in the Old Testament, appearing to Gideon, being with Gideon. Now, I know that takes something to get your head around. That's just for passing, as it were. But what 
Jesus even here is concerned about is what he's always concerned about, and that's salvation. And so when, when the people of Israel here are concerned about wanting a deliverer and wanting salvation, that's why he appears now to Gideon. So you may not have an appearance of Jesus coming to you and telling you what he wants you to do, but what you certainly do have is the Bible. And in that sense, Jesus walks off the pages of the Bible into your life. And in that sense, it's a personal encounter with God who presses your heart and speaks to you and challenges you. And what's the next stage after we've had that encounter with God and God challenges us to do something? Well, the next stage for Gideon is, and for us, is that God calls us to make an initial stand. Now, what that was for Gideon is in verses 25 through to 26. Let's read that together. It says, That same night the Lord said to him, Take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on top of this height. Using the wood of the Asherah pole that you cut down, offer the second bull as a burnt offering. Now, like many of the people in the area of the judges, we're thinking here Gideon and his family, uh, they would have worshipped God, God of Israel, but they also had the Canaanite, Midianite gods in their backyard. So they had both side by side. So they were more or less saying, I'll take the best of both worlds. I'll do this, and of course I'll also do that. I'll keep everybody happy. Which is many ways like our contemporary culture and society where we can try and keep everybody happy by having a little bit of Jesus but a little bit of everything else. And so that, and people would be very content with us doing that. You say, you can have Jesus, you can do your Jesus thing as long as, of course, you are still happy to do everything else and what we believe and what we think. And we also fall foul of the idols of capitalism and materialism, and everything else that we see in our world, it's just like having a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and it's very easy to fall into that mindset. But God didn't allow Gideon to stay with that. Verse 27, So Gideon took ten of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of his family and the townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. Some people can't have a go at Gideon, okay? He took a stand, but he did it when nobody was looking. He didn't have the guts to be a, a servant of God, and he tried to do it when no one was looking and under a cloak, as it were. But as some of the commentators say, all that was asked of Gideon was obedience, not courage. And perhaps we can also say positively for Gideon that for many followers of God, they're like lighthouses, you know, in that sense that the light shines far out. But underneath the lighthouse, it's all darkness. And that's the way many people can be in their witness for God. They can shine for Jesus far away from home, but at home, in their workplace, people who encounter them continually, that's where it is hardest to be a follower of God and follower of Jesus. And yet Gideon here went into his own backyard and made a stand where he broke down his father's altar to Baal and the Asherah pole beside it. We can be as timid and as feeble as Gideon, but there will be a time when we will need to take a stand for Jesus and we need to Prepare God's people for, for doing that and taking that. And when we do, actually, you may find that it's more surprising than you thought because I don't know how Gideon thought his father would react to this. Whether his father was going to chase him out of the house or worse. But when the townspeople came the next morning, you read that up to verse 31, and they came to his father and they says, Gideon needs to die for this. Gideon's father said, well, if you guys are so worried about Baal, let Baal look after him. And if Baal wants to kill him, let Baal kill him. So actually, Gideon's father ended up taking a stand 
because of something that Gideon did. He was challenged by his own son. And some people have said fathers may be older, but they're not always wiser. But we may have, likewise, similarly positive results from our stand for Jesus that surprise even ourselves. So as we're looking at Gideon, there is a need to have that personal encounter. There is a need to take a stand so that people know where you are with Jesus. That's what you're called to do. And the third thing that I see as a final lesson is a reminder that God will keep you and God will be with you. Probably the best known bit in this story is the bit that occurs at the very end of the passage, all about the fleece. You know where uh, Gideon's here and he's scared, he doesn't know what he's to do, and people say, well, this is what this is really about, is it's it's a lesson in finding out God's will. And so they will say, you need to push God in this way. So maybe if you have a job interview tomorrow, hopefully here no one does, uh, that after that job interview, and as you're driving home, you're praying to God, God, I don't know if I have to take this job or not, but if I am to take this job, here's what needs to happen. As soon as I get out of the car, and as soon as I open the door, and as soon as I walk past the phone, the phone is to ring. And if the phone rings, and if it's the guy offering me the job, then I will know that it's the right thing to do. Well, that's probably not the wisest thing solely to rely upon, so don't take that as your guidance. And other people will say, actually, what Gideon did here was totally wrong. Because they'll say, didn't Jesus say in the New Testament, don't put the Lord your God to the test? And what does Gideon say here? Let me test you. So I think this passage is pretty unique. Don't take it as your guidance in these matters. Because Gideon, he's in the Old Testament to start with. You've got the New Testament. You know a lot more about Jesus than Gideon uh, would ever have known, of course. And also I note here that Gideon wasn't told off by God, but God actually accommodated him and helped him here. But the theme for this, I don't think, is about finding God's will. But it's about something that's more significant. Because what did Gideon really want in these moments? What Gideon really wanted in these moments was to be assured of the Lord's presence. And that's the theme of the entire chapter. Go back to verse 12. Remember when the angel of the Lord appeared? He said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Verse 16, the Lord answered, I will be with you. And the real lesson here then is a reminder that God tells us that he is with us. Now we may be anxious and we may be fearful and we may be scared about a lot of things and we may be timid and we may be unsure about what we're to do at so many points and yet the wonderful encouragement here is that God is patient and God is kind and God accommodates himself to us and our weaknesses and what God reminds us today is that I am with you. And, of course, we know a lot more about God than the Old Testament people knew. Uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 remind us that in the former days, God did this. But now, in Jesus, God has done a new thing. We're coming close to Christmas, as I've already said. And we're reminding ourselves of of Jesus, specifically, of course, in, in those moments and in those occasions and we remind ourselves of what the name Jesus is really about that he's the savior but Emmanuel God is with us and that's a belief and a confidence that we need isn't it when we are struggling when we are fearful when we are timid when we when we don't know how we've got the strength to follow through with what we believe that God is laying upon our hearts we have this assurance today that God said I am with you with you tomorrow so we may of course we will be scared at times and we will wonder and we will lack faith and confidence won't we but remember that other incident in the new testament where there was a man who was wanting jesus help for a son who was sick and he comes up to jesus and he says i do believe but help my unbelief And that's 
what we need to ask Jesus. And it's that that Gideon asked, and it's that that Gideon received. And we will receive the assurance of God's presence with us as we make that stand and as we serve him and honor him. Let's pray. Lord, as we bow in your presence, it gives us a few moments just to consider where it might be that you are pressing something upon our hearts. In recent times, you may have been challenging us about something that you're calling us to do. Whether that is to have the nerve to, to step out and to follow you for the very first time. We've been fearful and timid about that. Wondering if we can keep that decision. Or Lord, maybe we have been walking with you for a long time, but you're saying something entirely new and that it is fearful. And we doubt. But Lord, may we remind ourselves today that you are sufficient. That you are strong. But above all, Lord, you've promised to be with us. So Lord, give us that confidence to serve you and honor you. Amen.